Good afternoon. Thank you to all the participants for um, joining us for this last session of day one of the Slave Dwelling Project Conference. Um, I am Teresa Lee, and I would like to welcome Ron Days to um, his presentation of We Wear the Mask. I'm going to pass it over to Ron. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and I've enjoyed the conference so far, and I'm honored to have been selected uh, to be on one of the presenters. Uh, this, is, this session is entitled, We Wear the Mask, Unraveled Truths in a Pre-Gullah Community. Um, I'm going to be uh, reciting um, lines from the title poem, We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Some of you may be familiar with it. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile but let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. These are pictures on the screen of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was an American poet, novelist, and short story writer of the late 19th and 20th centuries, born in Dayton, Ohio, to parents who had been enslaved in Kentucky before the American Civil War, Dunbar began writing stories and verse when he was a child. He became one of the first influential Black poets in American literature and was internationally acclaimed for his dialectic verse in his collections, which to many closely resembled Gullah Geechee speech. Uh, also pictured uh, is William Wallace McLeod, he acquired McLeod Plantation in 1851. McLeod Plantation was built on the riches of Sea Island cotton and on the labor of its 74 to 100 enslaved people. Located on James Island, South Carolina in Charleston County, it is known today as the McLeod Plantation Historic Site, an important 37 acre Gullah Geechee Heritage Site that has been carefully preserved in recognition of its cultural and historical significance. In April of last year, I began writing the, this piece of historical fiction of which I will be sharing excerpts in today's presentation. My writing followed a conversation with a friend, Paul Garbarini, some of you may know, he is an interpreter at McLeod Plantation Historic Site and co-founder of the Ancestors Fingermark Project. He told me about his research about the McLeod family and some of their heinous in interconnections with political organizations and slaver policies and racist points of view. So after the conversation, I began composing. I believe ancestral spirits wanted me to, uh, as Dr. Jeff Jeffrey stated in today's keynote address, narrate hard history, honestly, and to produce, as is the theme of this conference, changing narratives in changing times. And because my phone conversation with Paul ended with our discussing social media posts about the coming onslaught of masks to be purchased or made for proper social distancing, I was inspired by the title of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, We Wear the Mask. The setting of the story is the early 1800s and the subtitle is Unraveled Truths in a Pre-Gullah Community. Uh, it takes place on a cotton plantation on St. Helena Island, uh, South Carolina. For those who are unfamiliar with the term Gullah or Geechee, those words identify a language, a culture, and a group of people. Um, on the screen, is uh, 
a text or signage at a permanent exhibit at Brook Green Gardens in Morrow's Inlet, South Carolina, where I'm in, employed. Uh, it's written in Gullah. It's about the Gullah Geechee Garden. That's the way Gullah people would pronounce garden. Enter this ya garden for seed them ting what grow. These plant them have special meaning to explain what Gullah Geechee da. To people, what want for know? The crops they words would tell about this grand culture, the language, and the Gullah Geechee people, them, in Chadstown, South Carolina. The story that I'm referencing, of course, the setting is on St. Helena Island, South Carolina. Uh, and the best way to explain this uh, with the theme, Changing Narratives in Changing Times, is to explore the ensemble characters, the plot, and the masks. And these three categories will be juxtaposed with stanzas of We Wear the Mask. So about the ensemble characters, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. The enslavers in this story have nightmares about three black animals. They are Juba Bunny Rabbit, Sidney Steed, and Celia Mudstay. Um, the story begins with these lines. Once upon a time before the word Gullah resonated with power and before understanding prevailed that the African ancestors passed power on to their descendants, Buckras saw an owl during the day. Enslaved Africans eyed a kingfisher pass their way. Animals sensed and resolved problems and made them okay. And the enslaved were expectant that nature would have lots to say. Bakra, of course, is the Gullah Geechee expression for a white person, uh, as it was a white man, but it could identify a white person. Um, whenever, and Bakra saw an owl during the day. Owl dreams are a sign that one should be aware of any deceit or deception. And seeing an owl during the day signifies either a warning of an impending danger, a message about a major transition in one's life, or um, to look into, um, or a calling to look into your intuitive side for ancestors. Uh, these are things, signs, dreams that uh, many of African American heritage uh, can do quite easily and others find it a bit difficult. Seeing a kingfisher communicates that you should listen to your visions and dreams. And it symbolizes that you should overcome your fear of the unknown and plunge into something new. Uh, there is a Hausa story that is told at the beginning of the text and it's called the farmer, the snake, and the heron. The Gullah Geechee people are descendants of uh, enslaved, uh, enslaved West Africans, primarily from the Rice Coast, um, present day Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Uh, the Gold Coast, including Nigeria, uh, Benin, Ghana, and with the West Central African coast, um, including um, Gabon um, and Angol Congo and Angola. The Hausa people are from Northwestern Nigeria and Southern, um, and Southern Niger. The farmer, the snake and the heron, the story begins, Silky, supple, shiny, and smooth, Celia Mudsnake was hypnotically beautiful. Throughout her life, however, most who laid eyes upon her did not respond appreciatively to her appearance. 
they instead assigned nefarious attributes, sneaky, slithery, scary, sly. Celia longed to be regarded for her power, her brilliance. Writhing through the woods one morning, she remembered a tale from her childhood told by Grandpa Serpent. It was called The Farmer, the Snake, and the Heron. Once upon a time, a farmer was hoeing away on his farm. Soon, some people came along chasing a snake to kill it. Chop, 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 chop. The snake crawled to the farmer and pleaded, hide me, please, he said, hide me, please. Where shall I hide you, the farmer asked, and the snake replied, all I ask is that you save my life, save my life, please save my life. The farmer couldn't think of where to put the snake. At last, he bent down, spread open his buttocks, and the snake entered his anus. The snake chasers soon arrived and asked the farmer, where's the snake we were following? It came in your direction. We have to kill it. The farmer said, I haven't seen it. And the people turned around and went away. The farmer told the snake, come on out now. Your chasers have gone. But the snake replied, oh, no, I won't come out. I've got me a home now. And there was the farmer with a swollen belly like the one of a pregnant woman. The farmer walked off. He soon saw a heron. He whispered his troubles to the heron who thought of a plan to remedy it. Go and excrete, the heron said. Then when you have finished, move forward a little, but don't get up. Stay squatting with your head down and your buttocks up. Then wait until I get there. So the man went off and did just exactly as the heron had told him to do everything. And the snake put his head out and began to catch flies to eat. Then the heron struck and seized the snake's head. The heron pulled and he pulled until he had got the snake completely out and the man tumbled over. And the heron finished off the snake with his beak. The farmer rose and went over to the heron. Heron, he said, you got the snake out for me. Now, please give me some medicine to drink for the poison it left in my stomach. Go and find yourself some white fowls, six of them, the heron said. Cook them and eat them. They are the medicine. Oh, said the farmer, white fowl? But that's you. And he grabbed the heron, tied it up and went straight home. He took him into his hut and hung him up, the heron screeching and squawking all the while. The farmer's astonished wife said, oh, husband, that bird did you a kindness. He saved your life by getting the trouble out of your stomach for you. And now you have seized him and say that you are going to slaughter him. This cannot be, this cannot be. So the farmer's wife loosed the heron, but before he flew away, he pecked out one of her eyes. Ah, people, Celia hissed to herself about the memory. People, so strange, so strange. People don't know gratitude. The plot, why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. The enslaved in the story lived with oppression and a sense of spirituality, while the enslavers lived with a sense of superior, superiority and entitlement. Sidney Steed is driven by the slave driver, an African named Brutus. Sidney senses the oppression and stress of the human who sits upon him daily. In the evenings, Brutus hands Sidney over to Cujo, a preteen pre 
for grooming and watering. Cujo is the son of Hager the cook and Cuffy the driver. Cuffy, whose name means male child born on a Friday, shares with his son his recollection of his capture and transport to the new world. Without reservation, Cujo headed into the hallway and up the stairs. His father's skittishness about following Master McLeod's orders immediately did not dismay him. He'd heard the story of Cuffy's horrendous slave ship experience numerous times. An enraged African had jumped overboard soon after the slave ship guards and marched some of them to the deck from the bowels of the boat. Cuffy had borne witness to his son again and again. All Africans on deck had been commanded repeatedly to jump up and down, up and down, up and down. Many had found it difficult to move lively from being chained below for weeks together on the raw wooden floor, side by side, with chains around their feet and necks in a cesspit of excrement, blood, and pus from ruptured sores. Covey had seen only a few captives from his homeland, and they had been scattered far away throughout the vessel. The provoked African was an Akan chief, he'd reasoned because of the facial tribal markings. The African had been ordered to beat a metal spoon on the bottom of a large metal pot to make rhythms for the briefly unshackled but thoroughly sick and terrified captives to jump to. Chiefs do not beat drums, Cuffy had explained to his son. Others beat drums to announce a chief. In indignation, when the chief had seen a way to escape, he'd run quickly and jumped overboard. Not reaching the water, he'd landed in one of the smaller boats hanging on the ship's side. The white savages had raised the boat and recaptured the chief. Then they beheaded him in front of Cuffy and all others before they were led back down to the belly of the beast. The harsh and precipitous cruelty of white men was something Cuffy did not want his son to experience. The plot involves references to Denmark Vesey, involvement with the St. Andrews Agricultural and Police Academy, plans for continued systemic oppression of the enslaved workers, social mores, and instruments of oppression and dehumanization. In references to Denmark Vesey, elsewhere on the cloud plantation, Celia the mud snake rested in a cool hole below the big house. Juba bunny rabbit hungered in a burrow in the woods behind Slave Row. And Master Billy told his wife Hagatha about the dreams he'd been having and about his visit from members of the St. Andrews Agricultural and police society. Hagatha, darling, he spoke as they both sat on her side of the bed. A battle is brewing, and the good white people of this state must stay able and be ready to let all others know who the victor is and must always remain to be. Were any of us killed in that wicked rebellion in Charleston, Billy? Thank God, no. It was a big secret, though. Those ungrateful slaves had been listening to some free nigger poison their minds for months, and they were just a planning and a scheming right in front of their owners' faces. We treat them so good. Give them the clothes on their backs, the food in their bellies, and jobs, Billy, good jobs, so they don't have to just swing on the trees and eat bananas and drink milk from coconuts like the ones left in Africa do every day with the monkeys. They should be grateful. Grateful indeed, Billy retorted. He paused briefly then continued, damn that Denmark vessel to hell. Putting nonsense in these niggers 
heads that they should be free. Mm, mm, mm. They wouldn't know what to do with themselves if they were free. Now they say that Denmark, that Denmark boy was born a slave in the West Indies, but when he was brought to Charleston, some fool white man let him buy his freedom. Now we can't have that. No, we cannot. They say plans are being made to block the boats from those countries from docking in Charleston. We have to do what we can to keep those people who think like that Negra Denmark from contaminating the minds of our slaves. They are such peaceable people and we need to keep them that way. Now, Hagatha, three men from Charleston visited me while I was in the fields yesterday. They say they stopped by on the way to Hilton Head. They told me that when the legislature forms the St. Andrews Agricultural and Police Society, I need to be on board full throttle. And what's that about, Billy? It means we, the people, the white people of every town and village in this sovereign state will have the authority by law to patrol, police, and force and deal with all the slaves or free persons of color who act in any way that shows their lack of understanding or acceptance of who the rulers of this land are. Now, isn't that the way God intended? And on that note, the kerosene light in the McLeod Plantation House was extinguished and its owners began a deep an almost restful slumber. About social mores and the oppression. Uh, another scene. Dish a wedding the same thing. We got Massa McLeod to act like a full up with some evil spirit, Brutus. The slave driver said. Then he chuckled and winked at his wife, Mabel. I mean, more full of it evil than a full of it evil any other day, any. Both guffawed and tapped themselves on their thighs. Yesterday, Shri Mean Buckerman's ride up in the field where we been a pick to cotton. They stay on a horse and massa leave the field and walk over to talk to them. They talk low, low, but I'd stand close enough for yam. They ain't damn but no. They tell Massey I better tighten up the rope, pun the Negroes. They say the Negroes and Chas are gonna try for kill up the buckra what they up the road. So Massa better do what they have to do. What I mean, Mabel asked. Just yet me, Mabel. I soon can tell Hona what I mean. Same time now, Mimba with the bells round his neck, stoop down low in the road and they see a snake, a long black snake with a hiss at him. The snake been scared member, so member scream, turn round and staff a walk back slow, slow down the road. The bucket men's look at me, look and see. And then they ask, Billy, what that black cow to do? Master McLeod yell for me to go see what dig, what are going on. But the bucket men say, Billy, don't let no black boy do what a proud white man know for do. So massa pint for me to stop dead in me tracks. Then he going down the road itself. While him to walk, the bucker men's whisper to one another. One by one, them been say, that gal the runway in the middle of the day. We have to tell the governor whatever we see Billy do. And if he don't handle this right, and we get an invitation to this upcoming McLeod wedding, we have a tear him up. We can't let we family tan nothing with a white man or don't know how to treat the niggers. Mabel was dumbfounded at the thought of member being perceived to, being, to be running away. Anyone but member. not member with the bells around her neck, and no one else in the middle of the day, even not with Buckra, the plantation owner, and Brutus, the driver, in clear sight. Ever since Mimba had been caught and returned following a failed escape attempt four months prior, she was being punished by 
having to wear an elaborate metal collar fastened around her neck with a bolt that joined the two ends of the collar ring worn at the back of her neck the insidious instrument of torture was completed with a soldiered straight metal pole rising about three feet from the back of the collar ring in the area above the top of member's head the vertical pole was attached to three horizontal poles each slightly longer than the other the horizontal poles gave the monstrosity a triangular shape with a smaller pole on top cascading down to the longer pole on the bottom which was at least one foot higher than the top of member's head the most maddening feature of the contraption however was that on either side of the vertical pole each horizontal pole was armored with an equal number of small iron shaped bells four on the top six on the middle and eight on the bottom for a diabolical total of 18 small bells how some member with the bells gonna run away mabel asked with incredulity them bells don't stop ring every breeze that flutter a ring every time member move ahead a ring if them bells don't ring when they sleep for true they have a ring when they get up what i mean massa do when they get there where hop been in the row well him been say member tell him it been see a snake them bell must have been the thing scared that snake that why so it been a hiss and a fear hand been run the snake down and chop off a head buddhist exclaimed and he hides up the snake tail for everybody for see master tell member with the bells running neck for go set down for a lee bit for it going back in the row but when they going back to them mean buckra men's pon their horse they tell massa him ain't been act like no dignified white man they say all the niggers in the field been stop they walk and been stop the task from get done one of them even look round while i at me and i been to do what massa mcleod been say for me to do never no mind now they tell massa it better do something dignified or they been going to tell the governor and if the governor get win of what him do and and do him plantation king days been done done and nobody was somebody been going to come to his sister wedding so massa spin round and make me jump upon sydney and ride like the wind to buford to the buford store when i get there I ask him for the thing, Massa tell me for ask him for a speculum oyas. Ma Massa been say, but tell him he want the thing they use for the upper the negras upon the slave ship. And this is an actual picture of uh, what was used uh, for a metal collar to prevent running away in South Carolina during the 1830s. The mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries. To thee from so tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. The masks reflect understandings of conflicts with the supernatural. This is a scene um, Mabel, who is driver Brutus's wife, Mabel eyed the mortars and pestles in each yard along Slave Row and thought about what she'd prepare with rice for her husband's supper. She was pleased to have pounded and winnowed enough rice to last for the rest of the week on Saturday morning before going to the big house. On Sundays, the one day of rest for slave row occupants, Mabel found her way early in the morning down to the St. Helena Sound to bathe and wash her hair. She'd passed the slave graveyard overlooking the sound and coming and going 
would whisper greetings to the ancestral spirits that abided there. She'd notice the grave markers of clustered stones, conch shells, a corn cob pipe, or a favorite possession of the deceased, and cedar or cypress trees. And she'd eyeball the metal pipe jutting about one foot out of the most recent grave. It provided the man's widow a conduit to speak directly with the corpse below. Because the deceased worker had been brutally killed by a white man who had wrongfully thought the African had smiled at his wife, his grave and a few others had been dug north to south as a reminder to onlookers that this spirit and lineage would remain in peril until justice prevailed. As Mabel would wade into the water, she'd face east. In the same direction as the heads of the ancestors in the graves were directed to pay homage to her family across the water, where she knew the spirits of the deceased were now able to gather and then journey back to protect their loved ones in this foreign land. As she'd emerge, she would call on the ancestral spirits to watch over her. She would return home to oil plait or braid her hair and style it with beads, shells, or strips of cloth. The beauty of her hair was but one of her physical attributes that her Mende man found appealing. Her upright posture, groomed from toting baskets on her head since childhood, and the bounce of her well-rounded buttocks as she walked were among others. Thinking of Brutus as her hips undulated on her way home, Mabel reached to touch a shell braided into one of her plaits when she saw movement out of the corner of her left eye. A brown rabbit had hopped in the grass to the rear of the cabins along the dirt path. It now sat motionless near a bottle tree, its nose twitching and eyes blinking. Juba Bunny Rabbit watched admir admiringly as Mabel continued her way home. As Juba would have reflected about herself years ago, she thought the woman walking by was foxy, alluring, attractive, stimulating. Now, with her elongated top incisor and other growing teeth, Juba no longer considered herself as vibrant or sexual, but was thankful she could still hop and forage food. Another scene, um, that's the bay it's been with me. Uh, the McClouds are talking about their dreams of these black animals. That's the way it's been with me for the past three nights too, Belle, uh, Massa McLeod's sister said wearily, but it's a snake, a long black, thick black snake. The first night it was staring at me trans like, <coughs> I woke up. It's a wonder y'all didn't hear me. The next thing, that thing was on my lap and began to crawl up my side and around my back. I sat straight up in the bed, just like you did, Billy. Bell, what? And what on God's green earth happened in your dream last night, Billy asked. She answered after putting her clasped hands to her lips and then becoming a bit teary. I was walking down the aisle with you holding my arm and walking beside me, Billy, right in the front yard, under the magnolia trees, just like we've been planning, Agatha. And I looked ahead and saw Joshua John smiling at me. You know, I've never seen him before, but in my dream, he looked just as handsome as he does in the picture in my room, only he was dressed in his U.S. Army uniform. And in my dream, I'm feeling so good and beautiful and chaste, but then I see a look of panic on the Reverend's face. At first, I thought he was panicking about me somehow and the way I looked, or because maybe he had found out that Joshua, John, and me are, well, related, you know. But then I saw a look of panic on Joshua John's face too, and I realized that both of them were looking past me. So I turned around 
and that big black snake was slithering to more, toward me as fast as a locomotive, straight on up the bridle runner, the writhing, the slithering. Oh, it was despicable. That thing was on top of that beautiful, that all white, that expensive and embroidered net of Venetian lace. And all the guests started hightailing it out of their chairs. They were screaming and running away and not looking back. Everybody, Hagatha, even you. Bell's heaves and cries caused more vibrations in the walls and on the stairs. Black horses, black snakes, Hagatha reviled, looking first to her husband and then to her sister-in-law. And daggone it, there's been this god-awful black bunny in my dreams and for the same three nights. Maybe these dreams are coming because there's just too many of them tar black African people in this part of the world these days. Why, when we visit Charleston, that's all you see on the streets barking out things they want you to buy at the boat docks lifting and hauling. When they come into the stores where we shop, sometimes they just scare me the way they look at you from somewhere behind their eyes and the way they talk with that African gibberish. Dressed in pajamas and bathrobe, Billy paced the bathroom floor. The bunny, the black bunny in your dreams, Hagatha, what does it do? Oh, it torments me, she. Through these deadpan eyes, I go. One night it was on my pillow, so I couldn't get to the bed. Another night it was sitting on the window ledge. I was too scared to look outside. And last night, my, 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 in my dream last night, it was right over there on the threshold to, to this room. Hand trembling, she pointed to the door entrance. It was there just watching me as I moved this way or moved that way. I flung things at it, it had dodged them or they just passed through it and into the hallway. Those eyes, those strange big white eyes with large round midnight black eyeballs, you know what they were saying to me? William and Belle shook their heads and waited. Those eyes were telling me loud and clear. Stay ya in Disha room. If you wanna come out, come by me. I just wanted to smash it with a cast iron skillet. Then I would have Hager to dress it and stew it so I could eat it for supper. That's right. The ancestors, wanting a new story to emerge, assembled storytellers with a vibration, a flashing, and an intuitive urge. The animals embrace an acceptance of their innate abilities. They interpret that the dreams of the enslavers are linked to the enslaver's own behaviors. And together in the horse stable one night, Juba Bunny Rabbit, Sidney Strooks, Sidney Steed, and Celia Mudsnake create a new narrative that promotes respect of mankind, nature, and the universe. It's a retelling of uh, the story read earlier. The animal's conversation was revelatory yet wearying. To hydrate their parched spirits, Sidney Steed, Celia Mudsnake, and Juba Bunny Rabbit inched closer to the water trough. As they leaned forward to quench their throat, thirst, each saw their combined reflections staring back at them and sensed a vibration, a flashing, and an intuitive understanding. That was a story Grandpa Serpent told me, Celia hissed. May I share it, please? All agreed and listened intently to the telling. A new story needs to be told, Juba honked at its conclusion. There needs to be something. There needs to be a different ending. It needs to offer hope, Sidney Snade. The stories we tell ourselves that we listen to, that we allow to shape our minds, give us our personal freedom. They drank, then most slept. But throughout the night, Juba pieced together a new tale that she shared with the others in the early morning stillness. Once upon a time, a planter was working his field of Sea Island cotton and waiting for his wife and family members to join him. Soon, 
a mob of angry people came along, chasing a slave who'd escaped from a nearby plantation. Hide me, please, the African pleaded. Hide me, hide me. Where shall I hide you, the planter asked. And the African replied, I just ask you for do this one thing, sir. Save me life, save me life, please save me life. With closed palms, he placed his left hand on his hip and his right hand over his heart, watching the planter intently. The gesture learned in his Congo homeland was made to overcome a negative situation. The planter couldn't think of where to put the African, but at last he decided to open his barn and let the African hide there under the bales of cotton and hay. The mob soon arrived and asked the planter, where's the slave we were following? We have to punish him. He looks human, smells human, and acts human, but he is less than human. He is property and must be returned to the one who owns him. The planter said, I haven't seen it. And the plant and the people turned around and went away. The planter returned to the barn at the end of the day and told the slave, come out now, your chasers have gone. But the African replied, oh no, I ain't gonna come out. I scared them mean people to come back here. Did a drag me back and kill me. Let me stay here in this barn. In ya, I done meet a horse, a rabbit, and a snake. If you let me stay ya in this new house, I got charm these animals, and together we walk your land for true. But out of 12 moons, please give me my freedom. And there was the planter with a head full of worries. One, a new worker to feed, clothe, and look out for. Two, a rabbit that would eat all the vegetables in his garden, and three, a snake that could bite and kill him and his family members. The planter walked off. Down the road, he met Cad Eagle Feather, a Yemisee Indian walking to St. Helena Sound. The two exchanged friendly greetings and conversation. So the planter whispered his troubles to the new neighbor he'd found, Cad Eagle Feather, who thought of a plan to remedy it. Let him stay in your barn with the animals and farm supplies, Cad Eagle Feather said. Let him work for you for a year, for 12 months of labor doing things you are not physically able to do. He and the animals will do well together for with all things and in all things, we are relatives. After 12 months, go to the barn, meet with him to honor your promise. But before that day, leave a message for me at the Buford store. Then I will be there with you to make the announcement. So the planter went off and did exactly as Cad Eagle Feather had told him to do everything. During that time, the planter's cotton harvest increased tremendously. Cotton planters from far and near, convinced that only the planter and his family had worked their land, met with him. They encouraged him to purchase slaves so that he could produce even more cotton. They invited him to join their clubs and organizations. Over time, the planter's family became loose with their morals and corrupt in their hearts. They convinced themselves that the African was no better than the animals in the barn. The planter put a chain around the African so that he was tethered whenever he worked in the fields and whenever he ate his meals or slept in his barn. He told him he would never be free because he owned him now and he left no message for Cad Eagle Feather at the Buford store. Cad Eagle Feather showed up to the planter's house after the 12 moons following their meeting. He was returning home after his annual pilgrimage to the waters at St. Helena Sound. He wanted to make sure that the planter and his family were well. When he learned that the planter had enslaved the African and had not set him free, Cad Eagle Feather said, this man has shown no kindness. His work has increased your produce and your income. You are much better off now than you were 12 moons ago. So Cad Eagle Feather rushed to the barn to free the African. But the planter's wife, who had overheard the conversation, was enraged. That red man shouldn't be on our land, she yelled. What makes him think he can talk to you like that? 
she told her husband to tackle the Indian, to leave him chained in the barn, and to charge him with trespassing. She and her husband continued running to the barn after seeing Cat Eagle Feather open the barn door and enter. As they got close to the barn door, the steed bolted out and trampled and stomped the planter. The slithering snake bit and poisoned the planter's wife and sister. The freed African emerged and saw the carnage. He raised both hands above his head, spreading the fingers wide apart and proclaimed, good for him. It should have been grateful. And the bunny hopped to the garden and began nibbling all the vegetables. On the way home, Cad Eagle Feather communed with the ancestors and heard a new hum of blended elderly indigenous voices chanting and calling. When we show respect for living for other living things, they respond with respect to us. And since that day, a long time ago, many have found a new way and want others to know that wherever steeds gallop, snakes writhe and rabbits hop, a story that makes the ancestors smile can be heard by all who stop to hear it and receive it and not consider it a task to live authentic lives that don't require wearing a mask. That's the end of my presentation. Want to find out if any of the, the scenes brought about a sense um, of changing the narrative for any of you? Oh my goodness, Ron, that was delightful. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to display just a few of the comments um, here for you. Um, I, I, resounding um, applause coming from the audience. Um, wow, I think we're all pretty blown away. Um, I'm gonna give them just a moment to react and possibly ask some questions. So it was, it was phenomenal, thank you. Um, and somebody said they could listen to you read the phone book, by the way. <laughs> What? Thank you. <laughs> and the and I am um, Leslie commented and said um, she loves the the mix of contextual and story and it really is it's a beautiful blend of culture and art and um, scholarship so it, it's wonderful thank you thank you so. wow so um, I'm not so able to see any of the um, the chat. So I'm not able to respond in the chat, but I can I can see. Um, but every I think um, I can't I can't even describe the emojis that everybody is using. But it's really um, it was just phenomenal. Um, and we do have just a few more minutes. Okay. I figure I give them just another minute or two. Um, to, I'm sure if you go, I'm sure we can get a transcript of the chat to you as well. Um, okay. So you can you can see the feedback. Um, but it is. Um, oh, so Nicole asked, um, can you tell us again where we can order the book? Um, I hope that uh, an ebook would be ready, um, an audio book would be ready, but it is not um, available now. If anyone is interested. Um, at, on my website, www.rondays.com, I will form, inform people whenever it's available. Sure. Um, and somebody asked as well, I'm hearing these stories. What are some practical ways to ensure teens and youth in schools learn history through storytelling? Well, um, util utilizing stories is, is very helpful. Um, and in this example, I used a Hauser tale that I reshaped <laughs> to, um, and whenever uh, students can be asked to find out um, 
stories, family stories, or stories from their their communities, and uh, to devise new endings to them if they dislike the way that they ended, and that will help them to understand uh, their history and their culture um, better. Okay. Thank you. Um, and somebody else asked, how many variations on these stories are there? How many variations on the story, the farmer, on that one particular story or I'm, just on I'm stories? Not ex I'm, Leslie, can you clarify your question? Um, it just said these stories. But I agree um, to your point about stories in general. Um, I think the ability to um, to be able to tell stories, it, it, it reframes things for people. Yes. Um, she just said any of these stories. Um, I think she's probably referring to the the story that you used, the uh, the heron. The um, I'm uh, I'm unsure. Um, I had found that particular story uh, through Google. I wanted um, uh, a a West African tale. And I was intrigued by that one and how I it could be reframed for the, I'm sorry, for the story that I was writing. And that's what I did. I used that very same story in a whole different context. And I think um, storytelling can go a long way to um, to helping people process historical trauma. Um, yes. So, and it helps to change the narrative. Change the narrative, absolutely. Um, and Joe asked, are there are, are the rest of your family members as talented as you are? Oh, yes, they are <laughs> in their own unique ways. And somebody said that storytelling was a key factor in keeping our culture alive and keeping the connectivity to our ancestors. Absolutely, it is. Um, the earliest form of cultural transmission. Um, yes. And it absolutely is. Um, she corrected herself. She said with, with is instead of was. Mm -hmm. um, but it was absolutely beautiful. Let me give it just a Storytelling moment. and music. And there yes. were songs which were stories. <laughs> so, I, hear, I hear your wife, Natalie, is an amazing artist. Yes, she is. Wonderful. So, and for um, those who are interested, her uh, check out uh, nat NatalieDaysArt.com. What medium does she work in? Uh, she works in whatever. <laughs> she, whatever she finds or thinks up. <laughs> so, so, and somebody asked, how do you engage others in the field of history that claim oral stories are not real history? Um, for African-Americans, written histories have been treated by many white cultures as the most credible form of history. I'm going to answer that with um, an example. At Brook Green Gardens, one of the initiatives that I inherited upon coming um, uh, abo on board 17 years ago, there were to be um, uh, the installation of four larger than life sculptures, and sometimes in the immediate future. Uh, when they came, they were the planter, the overseer, the enslaved African male, and the enslaved African female. And I was uh, assigned to develop interpretation um, to connect these um, the, these sculptured figures. All were characters who helped to shape Gullah Geechee culture, language, foodways, um, uh, history itself. And I developed a story of what happened at Brook Green Plantation some 200 years ago. And it showed the um, different perspectives about life and death for each of those characters. Uh, they walk about to 11 listening stations hearing the story. When I had uh, pitched this idea to some of the staff members, um, their, their first, well, they thought that um, it would be different in, in the same context of some of the other uh, garden tours, et cetera. Uh, 
And I said, well, my understanding was that something new was wanted. Um, but they wanted something to explain more about uh, the, the, the archaeology that was done uh, to develop some of the, the uh, different things along the, the Low Country Trail. So I said, okay, and I developed it. And that script was soon, um, uh, a, they couldn't find people who would listen to it, but because this was a story that people could look at these sculptures and they could imagine things happening as they looked, it to this day is still very well received. There's, there's power in, in the story. There is. Um, and somebody, Leslie, um, commented in, she said these stories in and of themselves were efforts to change the narrative. Um, yes. The, and um, somebody asked if this would be offered in a print version as well. Um, hopefully one day it will be. My initial plan was to have it ready as an audio book. It's just been difficult finding publishers <laughs> of the numerous creations um, that have, I've been uh, working on since this pandemic began. <laughs> well, we look forward um, to whatever you can offer us. It was, it was so delightful and, and so amazing. We really do appreciate you. Um, and uh, I don't see any more questions. So I think we will say good evening and thank you again for joining us. Um, do you have Thank an you email address that you can provide in case folks want to reach out to sure. you personally? It's Ron Days, R O N D A I S E 09 at gmail.com. Well, thank you so much once again. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.